Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, apparently, it seems that there's some, there is some disturbance outside the embassy in the vicinity, so we are less than we expected, but still a respectable number. So it's my pleasure to introduce the ambassador of Italy, uh, His Excellency Armando Varricchio. Grazie, thank you very much. Welcome to the embassy. Um, there, as you know, there is a bicycle event going on, but we are very much in favor of the environmental support. This is a, a typical feature of this great capital city, uh, so we, there's nothing to, to complain. But anyway, um, caro Professor Pallavicini, Professor Zerbi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, such a pleasure to welcome you here to the embassy um, to uh, an special event which is part of a number of activities that uh, the embassy is hosting uh, on occasion of the uh, Berlin Science Week. Again, Berlin is a great capital. This is also a great place to promote science. Uh, and we are very proud that the embassy is taking part in this endeavor. Uh, it was just last year that we organized a panel on nuclear fusion at the Museum of Natural History and uh, a few weeks back we had here two great personalities, uh, the uh, chair of the Italian uh, National Research Center, CNR, Professor Carrozza, celebrating 100th year of CNR together with uh, uh, her good friend the chair of the Max Planck, a very young institution celebrating only 75 years. But uh, we're very pleased that we had here a very fruitful and uh, interesting discussion. Tonight we are focusing on the research on gravitational waves. Um, we would like to um, discuss, debate about an issue that has to do with the observation of gravitational waves a century after their prediction dates uh, only a few years back. Um, this topic uh, has turned crucial in many research fields, including the Italian project of the Einstein telescope. Um, and uh, uh, just recalling uh, an event that we were part of just a few days back, uh, I was really impressed by the last images coming from the Euclid telescope. Uh, what an emotion, I have to say. Because from bright stars to faint galaxies, it is certainly amazing how such technologies can dig far in space and in time. Um, so we cannot see tonight um, what the new generation of telescopes will discover in the coming years. Um, and uh, so opportunities are really uh, impressive and uh, um, in times when we are very much focusing on current events which are disturbing, um, it is good to look at uh, ahead of us uh, and to see how global science is able to address uh, issues that uh, will unify all mankind. Um, it was in 2021 that the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructure, including in its roadmap, a project for the construction of European uh, telescope. As I said, this is an Italian project, uh, conceptually developed thanks to the work of the Italian laboratory Virgo. This year, in 2023, two proposals for the site of such a telescope have been officially presented. One of them, coming from Italy, is to build infrastructure in a former mining area in the northeast of the island of Sardinia. The decision on the site, as you know, is expected next year, in 2024. Um, so bear with me, but um, I think that I could not resist this opportunity to take a few moments of your attention to underline the actual strength of the Italian proposal. 
we can rely on consistent experience in high-tech underground laboratories. As you'll know, the importance of the Gran Sasso area, uh, but uh, not to mention our solid and sound scientific tradition, which led to creating Virgo, the only currently existing European laboratory for gravitational waves. Also, Italy uh, can build uh, on the experience of the National Einstein Telescope Infrastructure Construction, just launched and financed with uh, resources coming from our national plan of recovery and resilience, also um, with uh, important funds coming from Region Sardinia. And I can see here the very old and famous uh, uh, symbol of Sardinia. And uh, I think that our uh, Professor Fiorentini uh, is not uh, strange to this symbol having here tonight. Um, furthermore, the territory of northeastern Sardinia is, uh, from a geological point of view, ideal uh, as a possible site. The creation of Einstein Telescope will open up opportunities for the development of knowledge and technologies. And this is expected to have and produce an impact on the economic, social, and cultural uh, environment. Um, now, um, I think that it's time to listen to the very interesting um, discussion. Uh, I think that uh, it is important that um, discussion on these uh, issues will contribute to paving the way forward to the setup of such an important endeavor like the Einstein Telescope in view of its positive impact on the exploration and discovery on so many aspects of the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So our first speaker is uh, the Vice President of ANFN, Marco Pallavicini, who is also Professor at the University of Genoa and the President of the Genoa Science Festival, so he's uh, probably used to this kind of situations. Please. Thank you very much. Thanks to all who joined this, uh, this event, and thanks for, to the Ambassador and to the Embassy for the, for the invitation. I will speak briefly because there will be many talks about Einstein Telescope, about its science, about the design of the detector, but I will focus a little bit on the reason why, as INFN, as Italy, as country, we are uh, advancing a candidature for, for building such a, such a beautiful instrument in Sardinia. Uh, first reason is that we have uh, ancient roots. The gravitational wave detection science in Italy is old because it was started by Edoardo Amaldi in the early 70s. Edoardo Amaldi was the, essentially the rebuilder of science after the war, created INFN, created CERN, created ESA, the European Space Agency, so one, was one of the actors of the renaissance of uh, Italian science after, after the war. And uh, among many things he did, he started in the 70s uh, the detection of gravitational waves. The original technology were, were antennas, which were uh, quite a uh, rough instrument compared to what we, did to, we do today, where there were just bars. Uh, trying to detect gravitational waves by, by making the bars in vibration. But it's thanks to this effort, which was not successful, is uh, the creation of a community, of a very large community that is the one that finally built the successful Vir Virgo detector and creates the community that now is behind Einstein Telescope. Virgo came next in the late 90s. The decision to build the Virgo was taken by INFN and CNRS in France. Very recently, NICEF from the Netherlands joined the European Gravitational um, Observatory, the EGO, which is running the Virgo detector in, in Italy. Uh, and Virgo is one of the two 
uh, instruments in the world capable to detect gravitational waves. As you know, gravitational waves have been discovered in 2015 by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration, first with the detection in LIGO, then with many detection also with Virgo. Uh, the, our, my colleagues will, will talk about it, so I don't need to go into that, but the key point is that uh, gravitational waves now are a real thing, a new way to look at the sky, a new way to look at physics, at the world of the universe as a whole. So it's a new science. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a short summary of the many firsts that came with Virgo, because having a new tool, you start seeing things that before you could not see. We, we saw directly black holes, so we saw neutron star, neutron star collisions. We detected, first of all, the gravitational waves. We started to look at the sky in a completely different way. And we could do it also because the technology that was developed is able to localize, at least when the three detectors can do it, uh, the origin of the gravitational waves. So you can also do astronomy with gravitational waves. Uh, the ET idea, the idea to build the third generation has also important roots. It was started by, by several people, but um, the, the leaders were Michele Puntura and Harald Löck, but, by the way, an Italian and a German, but this is just a coincidence today. But the important thing is that it was 2004. So well before the beginning of the Virgo, uh, data taking well before the discovery. It was a, just a dream at that time, but a lot of efforts were done uh, using uh, European uh, fundings. So many projects were funding the study of this, of this detector. And we finally, after the detection of gravitational waves, which is shown by that error, uh, there was of course a boost. So the project became an S3 proposal was approved, and now we have an infrared project starting the, the design of the European organization, and both in Italy and in the Netherlands, there is now substantial fundings to, to study the detectors and to, and to do the job. And of course, on our side, we also have the very important political statement by President Giorgio Meloni on June 6th, in which the official Italian candidature was brought forward and, and supported in a very open and strong way. Uh, you will hear from other speakers that we have a fantastic location to do the job. Uh, Sardinia is the least radio, um, sorry, is the least seismic place in, in Europe and among the least seismic places in the world. Italy is very seismic, so unfortunately we have a lot of earthquakes, but this is in the mainland. But if you go to Sardinia, you see from this map, the seismic activity is essentially absent. So it's a beautiful place with scarce population, with very good conditions to build a very quiet, a very effective underground detector. Uh, the space is uh, sufficient both for the so-called triangular shape, sorry, which is uh, the baseline, but also for the L-shaped detector, which is one that should be very carefully considered. And also, in our case, we have no problem in hosting such a, a different configuration. We are working to create conditions to do the job there. We started a new lab, which is called the Sosenatos Sargrav Laboratory. It's a very small lab, but equipped for very low noise measurements. And we are starting small scientific experiments underground in the region. And we are planning together with our enough colleagues and also colleagues from the INGV, the, the Italian Institute of Geophysics, to upgrade it and to make it a multidisciplinary. So there will be a new lab uh, monitored and controlled and owned by INFN, by INFN INGV. By the way, it's a, it's a new thing because it's the first time that we start an infrastructure in Italy altogether. The reason is that there is good science that can be done for gravitational waves. There is good science that can be done for ge geophysics. 
and there are good reasons for the astrophysics to have a very quiet lab to study their instrumentation. So it will be a lab that it will be useful for the three institutes and we will do it together. You will hear that we also had uh, some fundings from the region, so we will be able to start. We also had uh, very recently in the context of the so-called PNRR, which is a project at Italian level based on the, the European program for uh, after COVID recovery, and uh, we will have uh, 50 million, and we are trying already investing 50 million, both to study very carefully the site and uh, characterize very well with the big tender that will study the, the geology, will study how to do the excavation, will study where we should put the rock, we will sh we, to study all the elements that are relevant to make a very careful design of the, of the infrastructure. But we will also invest in all, our, all over the country to improve our labs and to, develop the, to be prepared to develop the many new technologies that ET requires. Uh, as I said, uh, this is the si June 6 event. It's a big event with the Prime Ministers and other four ministers and the Nobel Prize Giorgio Parisi and the President of NFN. It was done at Enough Home, so it, it, was, it was a joint event even in that case, but it was a very important and strong political sign in which the government clearly uh, made a strong statement about the will of our government to put the money in case the infrastructure come to Italy. Uh, there is a structure, this is a detail, it's for your reference, but there, was a red, there is a high-level committee defined at national level to organize the candidature, and there is also a special law already approved by the parliament to, pro to protect the site. No potentially harming activity around the AT site can be any more done in the sense that anything that you want to be there to, to do there must be approved by us by INFN. This is a big responsibility but it's also a way to protect the region and be sure that the extremely favorable conditions uh, that are there are kept and maintained during the the next 20 years or 30 years during the construction and operation of the instruments. So, we, have a, we are at the beginning of a very big journey. The Italian and INFN community are ready for the challenge and we are ready to take it. Clearly, it will be a very long-term research infrastructure for Europe. And this means that it must be thought and built thinking of its very long uh, use. It's going to probably run 50 years, so we have to do it in a place that can be upgraded, can be extended, can be operated over the next several decades, taking into account that science needs will change. A long way to say that it must be built in the best scientific place. It must be built where the scientific conditions are optimal, because you cannot know today exactly what you will need in 30 years from now, if you want to build an infrastructure, you want to do it where the noise conditions and the scientific conditions are better. Um, which means, in my opinion also, that you should, change, you should choose a geometry that can be extended, can be upgraded, possibly made it longer. And so, and I make no secret of this, I think that the double L option should be preferred, but this is of course a debate that will continue in the next years. Thank you very much. I think we will take, well, if, if there's any urgent, really urgent question, we can take it now, but we will have a question time at the end. Um, apologies for not mentioning that INFN is the National Institute for Nuclear Physics of Italy. I mention that because now we have the National Institute for Astrophysics um, who's rep that is represented by Filippo Zerbi, Director for Science of ENAF, an high energy astrophysicist and senior researcher at the Brera Observatory in Milan. 
Thank you. So uh, we learned what the Einstein telescope uh, is going to be from Marco, and the next speakers will also tell us how it is done and also the science case behind. So I'm using the few minutes that, of your attention that we have now to tell you why we are so excited about this program. Really, excitement, the astrophysical community is really excited about this program for a number of reasons. So let us go for the, on the first slide. You know, astrophysicists are a strange kind of animal. They are strange because they are, see, astrophysics is a synthesis between an exact science, physics, and the natural science, typical of, you know, botanists or entomologists or these kind of things. So we do apply, of course, rigorous method of scientific prediction, experiment, and verification, but we also enjoy to find another galaxy pretty, such, pretty as much as entomologists find another, you know, butterfly or something like that. And also, we really rely on observation, which for us is primary, nomenclature, classification, and catalogation. As you see in the figure over there, if you want to call M42 a nebula or, or, or a galaxy, it's not that much different of calling a, a plant uh, or, 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 or a butterfly. So in this, for this reason, we really rely on observation as the main source of information when we look at the sky to understand how the universe is done. We cannot predetermine what the universe does. We can only passively observe it, no experiment, we just passively observe it. And when we look at this, what we see is a bi-dimensional projection of 14 giga years of its history. Everything, you know, squeezed into a bi-dimensional bi -dimensional, uh, uh, image, let's say like that. An overlap of local and remote, ancient and recent, expected and unexpected, and also filtered by our own sensing system. This sensing system could be telescopes, detectors, models of interpretation. So many times in our world, as in our slang, we, we uh, identify this with the famous Schopenhauer's word uh, uh, as, will, and, uh, as uh, will and representation, and we see as the, 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 the surface of this 14 giga of history as the veil of Maya. And what we want to do, we want to go through this veil of Maya and, uh, and understand the reality that is behind. And the only way which you can do it is uh, to use the messengers that go through the veil of Maya. And these messengers from the universe uh, uh, are detected by our receivers from, from the bare human eye for, for a long time, because from the beginning of the human uh, existence up to quite recently, 400 years ago, that was the only way to look at the sky up to the sophisticated and modern observing facilities that we have now. No? The, uh, these messengers provide us elements to reconstruct what is behind the veil, because of course they have energies, frequencies, number, uh, direction of motion, and these kind of things that we can see. So we, we see through the veil of Maya by interpreting exactly the, the, the intimate nature of the messengers that is crucial. So nature and the energy of the message, origin of the message, spatial resolution, sensitivity, depth, and this kind of, kind of things. So this is why we you normally uh, do observational astrophysics. We go through the veil of Maya, and we just to get, we want to get as much messenger as we can through this veil to understand how the universe behaves, how the universe was created, and how the universe uh, does. Uh, for most of the history of humankind, the only messenger that we could get through the Veil of Maya were photons. We are photons of different kind. Up to very recently, the only type of messenger crossing the Veil of Maya were photons in, in the optical regime, optical photons. Matter of factly, to the naked eye from the origin to 1609, and the year, the year in which Galileo pointed the first telescope to the sky, and then from that year, through telescopes, uh, uh, progressively more complicated. These optical photons were joined later, very, very late, I would say, 1932, the first discovery detection of a radio signal from the universe by Jansky. 1932 is uh, the day before yesterday in, in terms of, of the history of humankind. And so up to then, then we added another kind of long, low energy photon, which is radio wavelengths. And they also have been uh, joined even more recently by an high energy photons. The first X-ray detection by Giacconi is dated 1962 with an IROB satellite. And the first gamma detection is the Vela satellite in the, in the decade of the 60s. So up to the, during the second part, let's say, of last century, we moved from the mechanicistic, simple universe, the universe that has light as a messenger, to 
galaxies merging, galaxies eating each other, uh, extremely high energy phenomena in galacti active galactic nuclei, simply by adding, adding an other energies of photons in the uh, area of radio wavelengths or in the, ar in the area of uh, X-ray and gamma rays. Now, of course, uh, what you see there is uh, the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which is something that we are aiming to, to understand what is behind the veil of Maya, but this is purely electromagnetic. So the origin of these things is always electromagnetic, and what we receive are photons. What happened? <coughs> the multi-wavelength astrophysics already provide you a lot of information. This is a typical example. If you take the Whirlpool galaxies, which is something that is also, uh, you can also look with the small telescopes if you are an, an amateur astronomer, uh, you, you will look at, uh, at, at with, your, with, with your eyes, so at optical wavelengths. But if you take an image of this galaxy at radio, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, or high energies, you look at very different sources, different mechanism of emission, different area of emission, and so you have a comprehensive information which provides you how this galaxy, specific galaxy, but any other galaxy or other object you want to look at, uh, uh, behave. So multi-wavelength astronomy has been extremely important up to the years, but now we are no longer multi-wavelength, we, we, we have gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are a messenger together with neutrinos, but we are not talking about neutrinos tonight, is a non-electromagnetic uh, uh, messenger that goes through the wave veil and gives us information of something that does not have to emit photons to be uh, seen and studied. It simply Black hole, black hole crashing is something that does not emit photon at all, but emit a signal that now we can receive. Gravitational waves were envisaged very early in the history of physics, 1893, 1905. Correctly, Marco pointed out 1916, because this is the first uh, mm, 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 talking about gravitational waves with the model behind general relativity before they were just simple concepts. The first indirect observation that also provided the first Nobel Prize in physics is the one of Halston Taylor, that they measured the decay, the time of decay of two uh, of a binary pulsar, so one pulsar uh, which two uh, new neutron stars that are rotating one over the other, and by measuring the difference in the uh, um, spin velocity, they could uh, exactly uh, uh, deduce that there was gravitational wave emission there, so indirect, and the direct observation that we all know is uh, in the, the Black hole, black hole merging detected by LIGO Virgo in 2015, which of course deserved another Nobel Prize to these three American colleagues in 2017. So this is for us the first time in history in which we have a non-electromagnetic messenger that goes through the veil of Maya and we can receive and get information from that. Non-electromagnetics. No, now we also move the nomenclature or the names from multi-wavelength astrophysics to multi-messenger astrophysics because we are adding a messenger that are not electromagnetic. So, uh, if we want to, to, to have one single example, which probably will be quoted also by other speakers tonight, of this uh, multi-messenger, successful multi-messenger astrophysics, is the famous neutron star, neutron star merging of uh, uh, the August uh, 2017, in which uh, it, it was detected 100 seconds of duration gravitational waves by Virgo and LIGO, a two-second gamma ray burst uh, identified by Fermi and Integral, starting at about 1.7 seconds after the gravitational waves, and also a long uh, days and months of, of afterglow in all the uh, lower wavelengths. No? This, is, uh, this is referred by the scientists to a kilonova. What is interesting is that the paper the major paper which recollected, there are plenty of papers, of course, on that, but the major paper that recollected these results is, has more than 4,000 authors for one single observation. is a lot. This is not a big experiment at CERN. This is one, one event from more than one, one 900 institutions, including many from INFN, INF, and other colleagues, and with data for more than 70 observatories from ground and space. And so the question is, what if we could get a statistically significant sample of this kind of objects, not one, Actually, there are two or three basic laws already, but many, and in other energies, in terms of, or in other in, in other area of the spectrum of the gravitational waves, which could provide us a different situation. This is for us is an extremely exciting perspective. So, <clears throat> what is the role of INAF? I have also to say because I'm representing INAF, the INAT. Well, INAF is the Italian national public entity that is controlled by the Ministry of Research that takes care of uh, uh, promoting and carry out programs in astrophysics and related technologies in Italy. We have 16 institutes in Italy and about 1,600 employees. We operate either on our own or in collaboration telescopes around the world, such as the National Telescope Galileo in the Canaries, the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona, 
the Rapid Eye Mount in Chile, MAGIC and Astri Cherenkov telescopes uh, in the Canaries again. We are also promoter or member on behalf of the government, when this is the case, of International Organization for Astrophysics, typically the European Southern Observatory, uh, in Chile and here in Germany, the headquarter, the Square Kilometer Array Observatory in Australia and South Africa, and the forthcoming Cherenkov Telescope Array in, in, in two areas, the Canary and Chile. So we have a lot of uh, eyes, uh, ears, noses to, to look up in the electromagnetic field that, that, that it could be you know, uh, uh, helpful to, to, to complete the observations when they will be there from the Einstein Telescope of Gravitational Waves in terms of multi-messenger astrophysics. So we also developed in collaboration with ASI, ESA and NASA some important uh, um, Space missions in this area, typically the BEPOSAX that discovered that was used to discover the gamma ray burst, the Swift satellite, Integral, Agile, and Fermi, and we certainly developed worldwide coordinated networks of ground-based telescopes from radio to Cherenkov to follow up transient source. This was done for the gamma ray burst, but was ready to use when the event of the gravitational wave was there, because the, the system of trigger and the time of trigger is pretty much the same. So uh, ENAF is prepared uh, to complement with expertise and facilities the detection of gravitational uh, wave sources by the forthcoming Einstein telescope, and this is the reason why we are so excited about being here with the INFN and all the other colleagues uh, to work on this program, because of course it, for us it's an important part, uh, part to go there. So uh, LIGO and Virgo, uh, we could, could see LIGO and Virgo as the Galileo telescope of gravitational waves, in the sense that the first attempt Galileo pointed at 2.5 centimeter telescopes and could, could realize that Jove, uh, Jupiter sorry, had some, some, some moons uh, with a lot of disaster on his life later, but this is out of the scope of this discussion. But then the principle that the telescope was a technology that was useful to understand the universe was there. And I think that we could see LIGO, uh, LIGO and Virgo exactly in the same roles. They had the, the idea of saying we can detect gravitational waves. Not all of them with this kind of detectors, but we can detect them. So, il, <clears throat> technology evolved the Galileo telescope into the, what we are, not, we are now calling the ELTs, the extremely large telescopes, such as the one that we are building of 29 meters in Chile through the European Saturn Observatory, and which has the same con concept of Galileo telescope, but of course dramatically enhanced performance. We look at the Einstein telescope uh, as the uh, first breakthrough step to evolve the concept of LIGO Virgo, enhancing consistently the performances and making you know, a path uh, toward uh, better quality and most uh, uh, interesting scientific di discoveries. So, uh, with ETINAC, with our friends DynaFen, are uh, eagerly looking forward uh, to a further breakthrough at the level, in the Ville of Maya with this fantastic infrastructure. And uh, of course, I mean, this is typical of our way of looking things. Uh, uh, it is not what we know that we will see or we expect that we will see that will be exciting. It's exactly what we don't know, expect to see that is the, exact, the exciting part of the game. So we are looking forward in the unknowns or the unknown of the unknown because the interesting part of the discovery is what you don't really think is there. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Now we go to we have two theoretical talks. The first is by Alessandro Nagar from uh, INFN Turin, who is a theoretical astrophysicist um, specialized in gravity and gravitational waves. Okay, thank you very much. So theoretical talk means that at this stage, people start being scared by theory, no? Because the idea is that we now, we talked about gravitational waves. These are wonderful, fantastic things. They have opened a new window in the universe. Yes, but what are gravitational waves, really? Because the idea of the, can you listen, can you hear, okay, you can hear. Um, so in the next uh, 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes, I will attempt to uh, convince you some ideas. Better here, sorry. If I don't break everything. So I will attempt to explain you, to you what general relativity is, what are Einstein's field equations, and from this to go to gravitational waves and have a pictorial idea of, uh, of what a gravitational wave really is. And at this stage, everybody is laughing. Very good. That was the first idea. Okay, now you don't laugh anymore. Because uh, uh, I was... Uh, 
uh, told to say, okay, you have to talk about the general theory of relativity. Everybody knows that Einstein was the most famous scientist in the world uh, after the First World War because of general relativity, but uh, what is general relativity? Okay, general relativity is that thing. This thing, okay, can I, uh, it's very complicated to, I am a theoretical physicist, so okay, it works. Uh, okay, general relativity is this. These are Einstein's field equations that nobody understands. One can even uh, not understand how to read these things. We can attempt to read everything together. Eh? Like, uh, no, maybe not. Anyway, this is R nu minus 1 half g mu nu r equal a p g divided by c to the fourth t mu nu. What is this? This is uh, a way of saying that the gravity force, the Newtonian instantaneous force, is replaced by the idea of an elastic space-time. An elastic, yes, an elastic space-time involved with a certain geometry. Force is replaced by geometry, the force is replaced by the idea of something that is deformed. But uh, this elastic medium is extremely rigid. And the fact that it's rigid is given by the fact that here you have the gravitational constant here that is small, and at the bottom, you have the fourth power of the speed of light. So it's like having, imagine you have a spring and you are attempting to move it. On the right, uh, there is this timonu that is deforming the spring. Timonu is really the mass of the contact, the mass of the space time. And on the left, you have the curve. The, 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 the matter. But now, uh, what is this G? Because one read this, okay, I don't understand what. what Okay, maybe one could look at this G here. Everybody is actually should be familiar with some notion of G, the gravitational field that everybody is experiencing in this, uh, in this room. That here is 981 meter uh, divided by second square. So, uh, yeah. I mean, was it a mess? Okay. Okay, this is working. Now, this is the gravitational field. Everybody here is feeling a gravitational field. Everybody knows from the very early from a very early age, that there is one number that is describing the additional field. Well, general relativity is a little bit more complicated because it is not just one number, but there are ten numbers. And it is not just the mass that is giving the additional force, but also the velocities, the, straight, the, the, the energy that is curving the space time. And all these things. Is it in this thing you on the right? So, when uh, the gravitational field of me starting is different from the gravitational field of me rotating and jumping because I am deformed the space time in a different way. And when I do this, I am actually creating gravitational waves in a very tiny and undetectable But the main point of the idea that you have to take away when you do this in this room is that uh, the notion of gravitation that normally in Newtonian theory is stuck, something stuck, is there off and uh, remains there forever, is something dynamic. Space time and rotation is something dynamic that can depend on time, it can be, uh, can, can change. And also that the gravitation is not uh, an instantaneous action, immediate instantaneous action. But it's something that propagates at the speed of light. And this is the relation of those those effects. Okay, I think I spent the 10 minutes on this, but at least you have uh, a hope, an idea. And uh, I wanted to put the same thing in a pictorial way, where on the left you see the space time, I mean, I wrote the Einstein's equations, uh, really as an object, where you can see that there are stars, uh, and it's the usual idea no, of the space time, it is the form of the present of water. Of matter, the stimulus, the stress energy tends to be relative to this energy, any kind of matter okay, that is attracted and deformed the space time. But now let's try to be more serious, and more serious means this. So our idea of the sometimes force is replaced by this image of a space time, a piece of fabric that is deformed by the presence of, of objects. And now, the fact that, I mean, the thing that everybody uh, should know, I mean, learn from the trajectories of the planets, from the sun, follows the ellipses of some trajectories, are actually, in the, in the geometrical picture, are the geodesics. Everybody is, uh, is uh, used to geodesics. No? I am on a, on a Euclidean space, a geodesic is just a straight line. 
on uh, the sphere of uh, geodesics. The geodesic is a uh, great symbol, not uh, everybody knows this. So, if the mean is the, is the line, the minimal length that connects the parts. Well, on the actual space time of space, let's say before the universe is automatic, the geodesics are our uh, elliptic orbits. Example, in the case of plants that are going on, uh, around the solar system. Okay, you should imagine that there is something there in the space space time that has these curves that are the equivalent of your straight lines on a plane, on a, on a Euclidean plane, or the uh, circles on a sphere. Everything is. Any doubt? <laughs> yes. In fact, this was amusing, no? <laughs> okay, but there is something more. Black holes. Everybody gets excited when they listen to the idea of black holes. No? Yes, very good. Right. Because the nice thing, the new thing of general relativity is that not only matter can bend with the space time, but also light can bend with space time. And, and Gravity reacts to gravity. So that in this case, for example, you see the weakness of the black hole, let's say, a point in the gravitational field there, mm -hmm. and these are light rays. When you are very far away from the origin, from the center of the field, you know light, uh, just follow the straight line, and the closer you get, the, the, the more the light. And at the moment, you have a moment where the, the, the light went so much that it is attracted inside the black hole and it cannot be seen. This is the black hole, and this will be the uh, center of our discussion in the next two or three slides. But before that, I want to pay tribute to, to some of you because one is always excited when you think you are excited by things. And you don't think that the light things that are going to be people who solved the, for example, the Einstein's equation that we showed at the very beginning. Very long ago, so here, for example, we had Carl Spalchin who solved the Einstein's equation in 1916, assuming that the space time is factor, and he uh, discovered the first starting of the world. He discovered the solution, but uh, it took uh, 50 years yeah, to understand that what he had found was a very modern and meaning. Of a, of a special circuit, which is the event horizon, uh, that, uh, from which light cannot escape. And on the other side, there is uh, Roy Kerr, who discovered another solution that is equivalent to that represents a rotating Okay. Now, up to, let's say, five years ago, when was 2015 or 2014, yes. Each time we have to remember so it's almost eight years ago, these events were just uh, mathematical solutions. Okay? We had something outside that English that we could interpret as very often were uh, excellent sources, but uh, these were mathematical things. Well, now we know that what is actually the character was to exist because we have measured them. We have measured the rotation, we have measured the characteristic their masses and their Okay, ah, but this was the cause. Now we have to talk about the gravitational waves. This is just after, after the, the, the thing. So, gravitational waves are hidden inside of the Einstein equations. So, there is this, uh, this space time. <coughs> if you take Einstein's equations, you realize that inside of those equations, there is a possibility of having something that is uh, a, a wave equation, and that the field, in fact, propagates the light in the wave. So, in, in the case of specific, I mean, if I am if I'm aware of the core of a strong and tight and beautiful before the space time around me, I will perform very strongly this space time here yeah, while I move and I do these kind of things. And then, when the deformation propagates far away from me, it just follows the real equation and it's tiny, but the rotation of the space time is flat, but there is no gravity. This is the gravitational problems. But uh, mm -hmm. then, the importance of the degree of is solved with a little bit a different dimension and ripples on the fire of straight time. You have to understand what the ripple is, you have to understand what the space time is, and then they tell you how you have to do it. If you are on a 
some, some water, and you are moving like this, and there are no so the water. But in practice, what gravitational waves do when they interact with the bodies, they deform them. Because first, and creating gravitational waves because they are deforming the cell, they are deforming the cell side. Well, if you delay gravitational waves, they can be an antenna and to be deformed by the space time, by the way you want to do this. And uh, the only bad thing is, is this. Uh, and for example, here you see this is a circle of particles. When a gravitational wave, uh, when a gravitational wave uh, impinges on the surface of the screen, those particles are deformed in one way or the other, polarization like uh, light, light. In many people are in this room are used to uh, electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves are generated by charges that are accelerated one towards the other, typically that charge. In the case of gravity, the charges, what are the charges in the case of gravity? I know that some of the images are masses. So instead of being charges that move accelerated, are masses that move accelerated, and in doing this, mass or energy, and this deforms the space time and create the gravitational waves. And uh, again, to take away mass, if the gravitational wave arrives here, this thing is the form of this way. In one of the first slides in my I showed the first uh, pressure bars, the first gravitational materials. The idea of the rest of bars was that this bar was suspended with, with, the, with the wire, it was isolated from whatever was inside, and uh, the, the, the idea was to measure the oscillation of this bar induced by the gravitational wave. Uh, what is occurring now is you don't see this, you see the modification of the arms of the interferometer. Uh, but okay, uh, that was, I hope this little bit, you are like this, you like it, but no. Yes, but that's a matter of no. To read the German version. I know, this was the first, uh, this was the, the article where the correct protocol formula, which is what you see there, that is the analog of the type of formula in the electronic was uh, uh, derived, and this is basically the basis. And also, very important thing, you can need gravitational waves to deform into a non sphere If you just have a sphere that is oscillating like this, that is breathing, this thing does not make a gravitational wave. The thing should be non sphere you need to have a quadrant that is moving. Okay, let's be more. I think I can skip this because uh, uh, we talked about this. This was the the whole survival cost experiment. So let's talk about the metals again, but not one single metals. A binary metal. Then you can discuss about non binary metals, but this is different. Anyway, binary metals. Uh, this was the for years uh, we wanted, we believed, we we wanted that this exists. Uh, we want to stick with this, but there is no proof that the binary metals really exist. So the idea is that there are two metals in the binary system. Originally, uh, there was a system of two stars, the two stars collapsed, there are two metals that are formed, and then the two objects uh, uh, rotate one another. <coughs> in the case, the space time is extremely uh, warm, the period with a lot of gravitational waves. Why do the gravitational waves? The orbit that is initially of the mission is in the net. Then it singularizes the definition of gravitational waves. And then the frequency of the because I'm also making a mistake away from the system. Gravitational waves, they go away, and then there are no magic matter. Real physical matter can be some job. In fact, it can be deformed in gravitational waves. Okay? And uh, uh, and for years, uh, people believe that this would be one of the most interesting sources for biological and mass interest to detect from the future. So, this is the gravitational point of the deformation, the way the formation of this thing would occur due to the motion that originally is quasi circular and at the moment the object. Uh, inspired mass and mass, then they merge and the single is formed, 
And then again, the single black body is not static, it's deformed, and oscillates as an isolated frequency, like uh, anything else. Okay? And uh, this was a theoretical understanding, uh, uh, many years for theoretical people to compute exactly this kind of way. And then there was a translation. And uh, this was like a miracle. I mean, this was actually a miracle. It was the first application of detection. And uh, the important point was uh, uh, first the discovery, the existence of binary uh, blocks. Because before this, we didn't know the binary blocks. As I said, we had just information from XY observation that there were things in the universe that were in X rays, and we see only records, single level, with masses at most of the solar masses. Here we have large masses, 29, where is it? Yes. 29 and 35 solar masses. But then there are many things that we, we can uh, hope to uh, improve once we have an instrument with a higher sensitivity. In particular, the structure of the database this looks like an amazing signal. But this signal is in fact perfectly compatible with the prediction of general relativity statistics. Perfect prediction of my mind, but uh, the perfect compatible means 10%. Uh, we want to be perfectly compatible with uh, 0, 0,1% uh, percent of the and do a lot of tests of GR. And for doing this, one needs a large signal to the so to see this noisy thing. The uh, bright uh, and I think that uh, at uh, this stage uh, we can uh, basically finish. Uh, yes, I think I can see this. This is not important. Uh, thank you very much. I suppose you will be glad to know that all of this has been uh, recorded on video, so any Perhaps somebody might have some doubts, or, and so you can watch the video and, and go back to the details. So now we have Michela Mappelli, who's a half, well, is, is, she's not, she's Italian, of course, but she is now a professor at the University of Heidelberg, a theoretical and computational astrophysicist, again, specializing in uh, gravitational waves. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today, and thanks for the invitation. And it's a honor to talk about the science that we will do with the Einstein Telescope. So, as Alessandra has already mentioned, uh, what we did with LIGO and Virgo in 2015 was a complete change of paradigm. Before the first ever detection of gravitational waves, we did not know that binary black hole exist, black holes that orbit about each other. We didn't know, we didn't have a direct proof that binary compact objects, so systems of two compact objects, can merge and leave a single compact object. Today, thanks to LIGO Virgo and now CAGRA, we know that binary black holes exist, we know that binary compact objects merge, and when they do, they emit gravitational waves. And in some cases, we know that these systems can emit electromagnetic radiation together with the gravitational waves, which is what we observed uh, in the case of the first binary neutron star mergers that we observed, 1708, 17. So why do we need the Einstein telescope? If we can do such a great science with LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA, why do we want an Einstein telescope? Well, I will try to give you a few good reasons, starting from uh, the resolution. Einstein telescope will be a new perspective on compact object mergers. For example, Today, we have not observed 
any event with LIGO and Virgo and CAGRA with a signal to noise ratio higher than 100. And we will probably never do. While with the Einstein telescope, we expect several thousand events with a signal to noise ratio higher than 100. And I know a signal to noise ratio is a technical thing, but let's try to understand it. A higher signal to noise ratio means uh, a higher resolution, means many more details uh, that you can understand from what you are observing. Uh, to make a metaphor, to give you a metaphor, uh, going from Ligon Virgo to the Einstein telescope is similar to going from um, an amateur telescope to the most sophisticated, the newest space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. Here you can see an image on the left of the pillars of creation. This has nothing to do with binary compot objects. It's a molecular cloud with <laughs> dust. But on the left you see the pillars of creation observed with an amateur telescope. Great photo for an amateur telescope. On the other image is the exact same molecular cloud, but you see how much more detail we can observe. Well, imagine to do that for binary black holes and binary neutron star. We can do that with the Einstein telescope. And nowadays, with LIGO and Virgo, we only observe nearby mergers. We observe systems that are basically in the garden of the Milky Way. While with the Einstein telescope, we will observe every single binary black hole merger across cosmic history. We may even reach a redshift of 100, which means when the universe was still in its infancy. It was just 20 million years old, which is a lot for us, but not for the universe. And thanks to this, we will uh, do cosmology. We will do actual cosmology with the Einstein telescope. And we will have an uh, amazing number of data. We will have up to 100,000 events per year. And what can we do with this wealth of new data that we have not done yet? Well, for example, we can probe the very first stars that formed in the universe, when the universe turned from dark to, to luminous. And we can probe the first black holes, the very first black holes that formed in the universe. We have never observed the first stars. There are some claims, but probably we don't. And we will observe, with the Einstein telescope, we will observe the first black holes that form from the collapse of the first stars before we actually observe the first stars. And this will be a humongous step forward to understand the formation of the first stars and galaxies in the universe. We will discover the evolution of binary black holes with cosmic time. Now we have just a suspect, a tiny suspect, that the properties of black holes change with redshift, with the cosmic time. With the Einstein telescope, we will probe, for example, if the mass of black holes changes with cosmic time. We may address one of the main open questions in astrophysics, which is how do supermassive black holes Form, black holes with a mass in excess of one million solar masses. So now we observe with LIGO and Virgo system with a mass of 10, 20, 30, up to 200 solar masses. But there is a huge gap between these black holes and understanding the formation of supermassive black holes. And with the Einstein telescope, we may be able to find the link, the missing link between supermassive black holes and stellar-sized small black holes, which are the intermediate mass black holes. And the main idea is that black holes and neutron stars come from the collapse of stars, of massive stars, when their nuclear fuel is over. So by studying black holes and neutron stars, we can unravel the secrets of massive stars. 
With the Einstein telescope, we will understand what happens when a star dies, if there is a core collapse supernova. And we will probably address the question if all massive stars form black holes and neutron stars when they die, and what is the evolution of massive binary systems. But it's not only about stellar astrophysics. With the Einstein telescope, we may probe uh, the nature of dark matter. Because we know that black holes and neutron stars can form from the collapse of stars. But there is also the possibility that black holes form from the collapse of fluctuations in the very early universe, much before the formation of the first stars. And this is what we call primordial black holes. And we do not know if they exist. But the Einstein telescope is the perfect tool to observe them. Uh, here I show you the famous cosmic pi that I call Planck pi because of the satellite that gave us these numbers. Where you see that the universe is made of normal matter, but just a tiny little piece of it, only 5%. But about 27% of the universe is made of dark matter, and we have no clue what dark matter is. Primordial black holes could be dark matter. They could be the main component or just one of the components of the dark matter. And finally, with the Einstein telescope, we can do cosmology, so study the expansion of the universe. And the cosmological parameters that define the expansion of the universe. Uh, you may have heard about the Hubble constant that is a way to measure the expansion of the universe. And uh, we already have measurement. We have uh, several measurements, and in particular two of them are based on the cosmic microwave background, which is the radiation, the fossil of the radiation that comes from the early universe. And then we have a measurement from type 1a supernovae, which are luminous supernovae. Well, these two measurements do not perfectly agree. There is a tension, we say. And with gravitational waves, we can have a third independent measurement that can give us the clue to understand the expansion of the universe. So I'm done. I hope that I gave you the take home message that we just started, we have just started exploring the universe with gravitational waves. And this is very exciting. But most of the universe is still inaccessible to LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA. With the Einstein telescope, we will unveil the cosmos with gravitational waves, and we will see binary compact object mergers across cosmic time. Thank you. Thank you, Michela. So next we have uh, Michele Punturo. Michele Punturo of the INFN is, um, is uh, the coordinator of Italian activities in the, in the area of uh, related to the Einstein Telescope, and in particular he's the co-chair of the steering committee of the International Committee that, uh, International Consortium for the Einstein Telescope. Okay, so uh, you saw in the brief first two talks uh, the strong willing of the agencies to realize uh, Einstein Telescope. Uh, hopefully in Italy, and uh, the incredible uh, science uh, targets that this kind of machine could, de could have, but now we have to realize it, and this is the difficult part, to uh, realize a machine that has this kind of performance. And this is what I will uh, try to describe you. But first of all, uh, one slide to say what is uh, the Einstein telescope, uh, Einstein telescope collaboration, scientific collaboration. Is a new collaboration we formally started uh, in uh, one year ago. Uh, in reality, uh, we are working on that since many years, more than 10 years. 
but the formal uh, um, birth of, of the uh, AT collaboration was in June 2022. And uh, by coincidence, as said by, by uh, Marco, the, the chairs of this collaboration is one is Italian and one is German. And uh, I'm the, the sports person, and Harald uh, Luke uh, of the Leibniz University of Hanover is the deputy sports person. So uh, we are working in this field since uh, decades. And the number of uh, people that are now uh, uh, collaborating in T, you see in this, uh, this slide, is more than 1,500, and we are continuously grow growing. It's clearly an European business, but not only European business, because you see that we are spreading around in Asia and in, uh, in, uh, in America, and so we, we are really growing up uh, as, a, as a global uh, effort. Uh, so it's, it's quite important because it's a, it's a a large enterprise. Okay, so um, you saw that uh, from the previous two talks that uh, there are many targets of science uh, that uh, uh, the uh, we, have, we will be able to detect almost all the collection binary black holes uh, uh, in the universe in the mass range of where we are sensible, of course, uh, and uh, a, a large fraction of the uh, neutral star collections. Uh, and uh, uh, I show these plots showing you that uh, in reality uh, we are the pioneer, pioneer of this idea of uh, new generation of GW detectors, but this now is a global idea because there is a project in the US that is called the Cosmic Explorer that is trying to, to realize a companion for Einstein Telescope. And uh, these two kind of uh, uh, observatories uh, uh, aims to, to uh, detect, as I told you, uh, almost all the collections in the universe uh, and with, uh, with a rate that is impressive, the order of 10 to the 5 per year. 10 to the 5 per year means that you have many overlapped events. So we will be dominated by events. In this moment, we have about one event per week. In this case, we'll have many events in the same uh, chunk of data, of minutes, of hours. So we'll be a nightmare to disentangle the two, uh, several events. I'm trying to go on. So uh, the, the, the challenge to realize Einstein telescope uh, uh, with respect to the current detectors, there is a, this is working, this object is too complex. So the blue curve is, uh, is essentially the current, the performance of the current detectors, the green and purple is Einstein Telescope uh, Cosmic Explorer. You see that uh, we need to gain a factor 10 in uh, 10, uh, 100 Hz, uh, and this is uh, relatively easy, but the most difficult part is to gain uh, for a T an order of magnitude of uh, 100,000 or maybe 1 million in the low frequency. But this target is the slide that, uh, uh, that uh, Alessandro has been not able to show. This target is important to to fill the gap between the stellar black holes that we are uh, detecting with the current detectors and the supermassive black hole that, uh, that Michela mentioned before. So this tiny range of frequency, very difficult to, to achieve, uh, is uh, really crucial for this kind of physics that has been described until now. So, uh, how it works uh, a gravitational wave detector. You see in the movie on the top uh, a, a sketch of uh, how Vir Virgo is working. Essentially, our interferometers is a Michelson interferometer. We are measuring the, the time difference of, uh, uh, of traveling of photons in the two arms. Uh, the two arms are, uh, are uh, um, modified, the, the time of travel, uh, by the wave that has been shown uh, uh, by, uh, by Alessandro, that is, uh, this is a tidal effect on on the detector, and is a Michael's interferometer with the Fabry Perot in the cavities so with many, many tricks, technological tricks, to, to arrive to the 10 to the minus 20 uh, in terms of uh, uh, strain, space time stream sensitivity uh, that we need uh, with respect to the level of noise that we have on the Earth. And uh, so the requirements of Einstein Telescope are that, that we want to have a very wide frequency range, so access this small uh, few hertz frequency band for, this, for the intermediate mass black holes. We want to be able to localize a source. We want to be able to cover the sky, uh, to disentangle the two polarization that has been mentioned. 
high reliability, high signal to noise ratio has been mentioned. And then uh, to realize all that, uh, we uh, data requirements, the design specification are uh, the list that you see. We need to realize uh, longer arms. Uh, Virgo is three kilometer long arm, LIGO four kilometer. We are proposing uh, at least uh, 10 kilometers or maybe more, maybe 15 as a as I've been mentioned. Uh, uh, we need to go underground to access the low frequency because otherwise we are dominated by the seismic, uh, seismic wall. The seismic uh, vibration of the soil is too large. Uh, we need to, uh, to uh, for the low frequency, we need to be cryogenic also because uh, thermal noise is an enemy. Uh, we need to realize uh, uh, something that uh, is new. Uh, it is a called xylophone approach. Each uh, LIGO and Virgo are one interferometer. We want to realize for each detector two interferometers, one for the low frequency and one for the high frequency. In this way, we increase the engineeristic uh, complexity, but we decrease the challenge for each uh, detector that, that we, we, we realize. And then we need uh, to implement a multi a multi-detector design, so to have more than one detector. Uh, and, uh, Maybe you see in this picture triangular shape. The triangular shape in reality, in reality is in gray because it was a, 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 an hypothesis that we made in 2011 when we made the first conceptual design. Uh, and that was uh, determined by the several reasons. The, the, the major one was the cost. Uh, with the triangular shape, you reduce the cost of excavation. Okay? Uh, now there is a long discussion in this moment uh, in the collaboration uh, about uh, what is the best solution to go with the triangular shape or with the 2L shape has been mentioned and this discussion for the scientific point of view has been solved. There is a beautiful paper, Marika Barquez et al, you see the, the paper there, uh, and that is a, a, a 200 page document, so it's uh, very long, uh, and uh, uh, where all the science targets have been analyzed and uh, apart very very few cases, uh, let's say a 15 kilometer 2L geometry shows uh, an improved the science return uh, uh, for, for, for Einstein telescope. Of course, uh, the, a so complex decision is not only driven by the scientific targets, then there are risks, then there are uh, technological solutions, and then there are, there are uh, uh, financial aspects. So all, when all these boxes will be filled, uh, we will have the answer where we are. So I have still two minutes. New technology. We need to develop a lot of technology because, as uh, you see, we improve a factor three the length of the arm. We increase a factor three the length of the arm, maybe four, uh, and uh, then we want again a factor uh, ten. Uh, that something is not uh, is strange because uh, the length is the, the, the sensitivity is directly proportional to the length. So there is a trick. The trick is technology. We need a lot to develop a lot of technology to reduce the noise of our detectors. And for the low frequency, uh, the, the, the frometer devoted to the fre frequency, low frequency, this is a real new technology. Uh, of course, an engineering a, a challenge for uh, going on the ground, cryogenics without uh, uh, vibration, new kind of optics in silicon instead of fused silica, uh, and then seismic suspension, frequency dependent squeezing. This is very nice, I have no time to talk about, but is uh, the technique that transforms the four kilometer, 10 kilometer object in a quantum device. It's a really quantum device, the largest quantum device you can imagine. And for the high frequency interferometer instead is a brute force approach with the rest of the recurrent uh, interferometer. I will not go into detail. So this beautiful picture shows you that uh, the complexity of the object they want, want to realize underground. This means the complexity of the engineering solution that we have to implement in this, uh, in this configuration. Uh, just to compare, 30 kilometers of tunnel underground, uh, if you compare to the, all the road tunnels that are around the world, is by far the, lar the longest, okay? The longest uh, tunnel for a road is 25 kilometers, so this is the longest. If you compare in the, with train uh, railway tunnels, we are in the, in the first 10, in the first 10 uh, uh, rank. So, but it's not correct to compare with the road or train uh, tunnel, it's right to compare with respect to complex research infrastructure like CERN or like uh, uh, the Grand, Grand Sasso laboratories. So these are the, uh, our kind of comparisons for, for that. 
So technology, I, I told you cryogenics, uh, we, are, we need to develop uh, a cryogenic system, not for really for the, the, the challenge is not the temperature. We uh, will work around 10K, it's not uh, 10 Kelvin, it's not uh, so not challenging. The challenge to reach 10K without introducing vibration and without, contamina without introducing contamination of the mirrors. And we are developing technology, for example, in Rome, we have the, the Amaldi Research Center where there is a developing of this uh, cryogenic Technique. As I told you, the most challenging part, I, I exhausted my time, so I will be very fast. The most challenging part is the low frequency. Uh, and uh, the, the, in the low frequency, there are a lot of R&D, but we, we hope a lot on the performance of the, of, the, of the country, of the place where we realize the T, and this will be described by Alessandro Cardini. And uh, for the optics, as I told you, we needed to develop a new optics, uh, and uh, this will be an industrial development because silicon is really an industrial object. And coating, our mirrors are uh, reflective because there is a coating. We need to develop a new cryogenic technology for coatings. For optoelectronics, uh, we are in a good shape. Laser, we already have our solutions, but all the optoelectronics needs to be adapted to the new lasers. And uh, the most challenging uh, uh, part is also the vacuum. We will be, IT will be the largest uh, volume under vacuum. And uh, for this reason, we are profiting of the collaboration of CERN. CERN has a huge expertise to make uh, large pipes, uh, long pipes under vacuum. And there is an agreement with CERN to develop that. This is a network of R&D facilities, a large one. We define large if we invested a few millions on them. The large facilities that are in this moment realized under realization in Europe for testing AT technologies. And in particular in Italy, as I mentioned by, by Marco, we had a grant of 50, not only this grant of 50 million, there are also others. This is building a network of laboratories of institutions that are collaborating with the Einstein Telescope and uh, there are two targets. One, of course, the candidature of the T-sites in Sardinia and the other, a nectar of, of, uh, of facilities to develop uh, AT technologies. So, more or less, I, I've been almost in time. Thank you, Michele. So to build stuff, you need industry, and so it's fitting that the next speaker is Mauro Morandin, who, will, who is the Industrial Liaison Office for Italy at CERN, no less. Many thanks for inviting us here. And yes, I am the Industrial Liaison Officer, the Italian Industrial Liaison Officer at CERN and uh, at ESS, the European Spallation Source uh, in Lund. And uh, I would like to start just by making a consideration. Clearly, uh, the Einstein Telescope will be the next big uh, uh, scientific infrastructure in Europe, and it, it will be the last member of a prestigious club that you can see here. And from the point of view of the important technology development that uh, uh, Einstein Telescope uh, will have to face, I think uh, uh, having these uh, facilities in Europe is a guarantee that uh, we can manage uh, these kind of projects. And we have developed uh, in these facilities um, a very large uh, engineering expertise that is actually uh, already being exploited because CERN, for example, is participating in the development of Einstein Telescope now, and they are giving a uh, significant contribution. So, the point now is uh, why it's important to have this, uh, technology, this infrastructure in Europe, of course, for science. This is the main reason for building this infrastructure. But people have started also to see what the impact is when you uh, uh, construct this uh, infrastructure for society in general. And economists have tried to, uh, as is, is their job, of course, to assign uh, uh, numbers uh, to the value of things and, and they have done in the, uh, recently a cost-benefit analysis of large infrastructure. And this is an example taken from uh, LHC at CERN of uh, the uh, cost of the uh, uh, infrastructure, which is up there, 13 uh, billion euros, including everything over 30 years. 
so upgrades, detectors, and so on. And what is the estimate or the benefits that society can get from, uh, from such an infrastructure? And you can see the, the most important uh, uh, return that society has is human capital and technology spillovers. These are the two most important. Of course, human capital, because uh, uh, LSC and CERN is a place where a lot of young people uh, come and are trained. And uh, technological spillovers, because of course, there are a lot of innovation that uh, can originate from the lab and from the interaction of the lab with the industry. And if we go more closely to what is the benefit for industry, then there have been also in this case several investigation that, that uh, have been done. And this is just uh, one of the, uh, of the outcome that was obtained by a survey of suppliers at CERN. And you can see that uh, there are significant uh, return for industry when there is a collaboration with such a big uh, um, research infrastructure. For example, 48 percent of the companies improved the products and services after interacting with CERN, 42 developed new products, 55 improved the, the technolog uh, technological uh, knowledge in their field, and so on, and uh, even uh, 62 were able to exploit uh, CERN as a market uh, reference. So there is a big impact for companies that collaborate with uh, with this uh, research infrastructure. And uh, the relationship that industry has is a bit special because uh, these infrastructure that are now uh, known as big science uh, organization do invest a substantial part of their budget to build uh, equipment and uh, that is uh, beyond state of the art. So we request new technologies and in some cases the final products just do not exist in the market. So they have to be developed or co-developed with the industry and then industry has to do the engineering part and then of course the production. In other cases products exist but they have to be manufactured with special technologies in order to cope with the stream conditions where they have to operate for example high radiation environment or very or ultra high vacuum and so on. So companies uh, in some sense uh, are not longer just suppliers they become partners of the infrastructures. And there is a very fruitful transfer of knowledge that takes place between the labs and the company and sometimes vice versa. Because sometimes uh, is, uh, the companies uh, are uh, proposing uh, technology that can solve the, the problems that research infrastructure are uh, facing. So I think uh, Einstein Telescope uh, with uh, his challenging program of uh, technology development that Michele has just presented will offer uh, several of these opportunities to uh, the European industry. And just to give you an idea of what is the ballpark of uh, investment that uh, this uh, big science organization uh, just uh, uh, use for procurement and so to, to get contract uh, uh, with the industry you can see here a table that was uh, um, computed a couple of years ago showing what is the annual amount of uh, money that the various um, big science organizations spend on procurement uh, on average uh, every year uh, from 2002 and 2006, uh, of course, with some forecast. And uh, as you can see, there is, uh, of course, a uh, very large amount of investment that, that we do in space with the European space agencies, but then uh, also other uh, BSO like CERN or Fusion for Energy that is in charge of building the uh, biggest um, reactor for, for fusion uh, in Kadarash uh, is doing. So, and you see, uh, if we compare with what uh, can be the investment when ET will be built, it will be a significant uh, amount of money, like uh, 100, 150 uh, millions per year. So it will be well uh, represented in this, uh, in this table. And uh, I think for industry now is uh, time to start uh, cooperating with the Einstein Telescope. And the first opportunities come from the money that has been uh, 
uh, earmarked by national institutions and governments and the, the uh, 50 million of the ethic uh, project was already mentioned. There is a similar amount also in, uh, in the, uh, that was provided by the Dutch government. And so uh, these are the first opportunity that uh, industry have. And uh, now we are trying to uh, increase the engagement of companies, uh, not only in Italy or in the Netherlands, but also all over Europe. We had uh, a meeting recently in Italy uh, in February where there were 50 representatives from, uh, from Italian industry that participated. But we have this project now, the preparatory phase uh, ice and telescope project, and we are starting within uh, that context uh, to now uh, address uh, uh, the industry audience at the European level. And we will start with webinars and B2B meetings on each specific relevant technology sector to, to enlarge the, the engagement. Of course, we need to have the, the largest engagement also because if you want countries to participate in the project, they, they, sh they should also see that there are some return that they can have as, as countries. So um, now the, the question, of course, for us is, uh, is the Italian industry ready for Iceland Telescope? And uh, I think if we look at the experience with the, the European big science organization so far, the, the, the outcome is quite encouraging. I just flashed two examples. One is CERN. CERN um, as you have seen, is one of the research uh, infrastructure that spend most money, more money on, uh, on uh, uh, procurement, and uh, they do a com just a, a computation of a coefficient that shows what is the level of industrial return that, has, that every country has. And uh, uh, you can see in this uh, map that uh, the countries that are in the darkest color are the one with the highest return. And Italy is one of those and has been uh, basically uh, in the same position on the ranking for the last uh, eight years. So I think this is a, a good signal that uh, Italian industry is competitive and, and can uh, really give uh, important contribution. If you look at another sector, completely different sector, this is fusion. And you can see there that there, are, there is a, a, a histogram with uh, high tech and uh, so let's call it the low tech tenders. And you can see clearly that uh, uh, Italy is uh, uh, the one country that has the largest return in high tech sectors. Of course, France uh, is investing a lot of money in civil engineering, so they, they have this uh, high bar, but but really what sticks out here is the contribution of high-tech contracts that Italy was able to get. And also here you have a plot of the competitiveness of, of our company. So I think I don't need to, I guess, at this point to convince you that, that really the Italian industry can have a, a big uh, a role in, uh, in providing services and products for Einstein Telescope. And this is just a, another example if we look at those sectors where Italian companies have reached a, a position of leadership worldwide. Uh, you can see there are many. And uh, several of these sectors are the ones that are also useful for eyes and telescope. So I, I wanted to mention, but I will go very fast. I wanted to mention an example of a successful example of collaboration between big science organization and, uh, and industry. And uh, uh, among the many that I, I could uh, mention, uh, I picked up this because this was a collaboration between a German laboratory, XFEL, in Hamburg, and uh, two companies, one Italian and one uh, and the other was a German company. And uh, they were involved in the preparation of uh, a, a device that uh, is called the uh, radio frequency superconducting cavity. It's the heart of the accelerator. And not, it's, the, it's the real heart because uh, as, as the, the heart beats uh, pushing the blood, uh, the radio frequency cavity, they, by electromagnetic pulses, they 
really boost the particles and so that they are accelerated. And uh, so in this case, uh, the challenge was uh, to, to build for, for the first time a lot of these uh, cavities, uh, nearly 800, and uh, that uh, had to be superconductive. So with a special treatment of uh, the surface of the niobium material and so on. So to make it short, uh, I think this requires uh, a significant uh, technology transfer and also some uh, flexibility in the relationship between industry and companies that I think uh, will be important also for Einstein Telescope. And just to come to the end, this is a size uh, um, made it possible for these two companies to become leaders worldwide and now they are supplying these special cavities for accelerators all over the world. So this was the outcome of this uh, uh, very successful collaboration. So we hope that this will happen also in Einstein Telescope that uh, will surely open up very interesting opportunities for European industry and um, I think industry will benefit for sure and one lesson that we have learned and that companies uh, keep telling us is that the sooner they are involved in developing technologies and products and the best is for both sides. It's difficult sometimes but it's something to be pursued. Italian industry has been a key player and uh, I hope that this will be the case also for ET. However, it's important that of course uh, also for the specific companies that they have there is now um, an engagement of companies uh, from other European countries and this is what we are trying to pursue now. Last just flash is the big science organization in Europe are now organizing uh, most the, the event which is the most important opportunity to, to have a meeting from uh, for, uh, among companies and uh, big science organization. The third edition of this event will be held in Trieste next year and uh, uh, ET will have the floor there and uh, I think uh, this will be probably the, the, um, a good opportunity really to, to present to a, a large audience of companies the opportunities that ET will provide. Thank you. Thank you, Mauro. So we are now coming to the last, uh, the last talk. There's no, I mean, let's not uh, run around it. It's an interesting thing, right? So it's the Italian proposal, the Italian site, and it's uh, particularly near to my heart because I, I lived and worked in Sardinia for many years. And we have my good friend Alessandro Cardini, who is the director of the INFN section in Cagliari, and he's responsible for a lot of activities and a lot of money being spent on uh, technology, enabling technology for the Einstein Telescope. Thank you, Vincenzo. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So it's my pleasure to, to present you the the Sardinian site. So why we decided to, to do this, I mean, why we want to do this thing in Sardinia. So first of all, I mean, it was already mentioned, the Sardinia is uh, it's, it's a very uh, stable place in, uh, in, in Europe. It's uh, in particular the Sardinia Corsica microplate is very, is very stable because it's far from active fault lines. So there, there is very tiny seismic activity and there is low crustal deformation, so no movement of the, of, of, of the, of the land. So this is why we started to look into Sardinia and uh, we, the, the place where we want to do the Einstein telescope, it's, uh, it's here in the middle of the Barbagia region near a mine, an ex-mine called uh, Sosenatos. So, there is, there, are good, there is a good rock quality. I mean, you, are, you, you need to build a very sensitive instrument. You need like a, an, an optical bench where to assemble your optics. And this is, I mean, in, in, uh, from the geological point of view, you need hard rock. And you, we have it here. And uh, so uh, the, the, the rock quality is uh, uh, granitoids, etc. And there is an, an ongoing geological survey in the area that we are pursuing. The, we arrived in the, in the Sosenatos mine because we wanted to have, uh, since we want to build this 
uh, infrastructures underground, we were looking for a place where we could install instruments underground in an easy way. Okay. So there was this uh, mine, a former lead and zinc mine, not in operation anymore, and we were able to, to access the underground area and install the instruments. The first instruments were installed in 2010, 2014. There was a first seismic uh, campaign, but then the advanced site characterization started in a more exhaustive way since 2019. So you can see uh, the landscape here. When, uh, when we are looking for a quiet place, this is really a quiet place because there's, I mean, you cannot see from that picture any human activity, right? So, uh, in, uh, in this mine, since we can uh, use the, the tunnels which are already there, we installed a permanent array uh, underground made of many stations where instruments are located. So, the, the mine is very easy to access because we have an entrance where we can enter with, uh, with the car. And then, going, oops, sorry. Sorry. Then, uh, going down in the tunnel, we reach a first laboratory, this one here, where some instruments are located. Then we continue going down in the ramp. There is another lab. And we continue down to the, to the bottom of the mine, where there is a, a third uh, laboratory underground. So in all this laboratory, we have a, a sism seismographer, and we have magnetometers which are installed in these uh, conditions, and we have uh, fiber optics connection, so to bring out the signals in the control room on, uh, on the surface, which is here, above. And then we also have some other in infrastru uh, instrument located on, on the surface. So what we see, well, well one of the first measurement is uh, this one here. So those plots that I will be keeping sh showing, this is more or less the amplitude of the disturbance as a function of the frequency, okay? So uh, the, the, the color line are, let's say, the superposition of all the measurement we did, and the, the dashed black lines represent the lowest level of noise of all possible seismic station monitored on Earth. So you can see that uh, our measurement really approach in particular range of frequency between uh, more or less one and 10 Hertz, this dashed line. So we are already, we know that we, we are in a very quiet place. So when we look in more details, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this figure, we can see, and then you can see here, for example, we can see that we have some peaks and those peaks represent uh, a specific frequency in the vibration, okay? A specific uh, typical vibration. And this typical vibration is due to the waves which arrives from the Gulf de Lyon and touch the Sardinia in a repetitive way. So this is the typical frequency of the wave touching the, the west coast of Sardinia. And this was uh, demonstrated because if we look here, this uh, is a plot in time which represent the, the sea wave uh, height in blue here, and uh, in, uh, in red here, you can see the amplitude of this, uh, of this uh, sound, which is measured underground. So definitely, in this uh, below one hertz, there is, there are, we have this wave, and uh, then if we go to higher frequencies, in particular in the range between 5 and 20 hertz, we have the, the noise made by human activity. And here you can see day, night, day, night, day, night, and then weekends, and then you have a decrease when we, had, we are in lockdown. So these are really things you can really measure, okay? Uh, in order really to understand that this noise was really coming from the waves, for example, because in the previous plot, you, we only, it was r reasonable to, to be due to the waves. We installed a, a surface array on a hill nearby. So a surface array is like, a, you know, a set of antenna which are looking at the same place. And so we, we correlate in time the signals coming, the, the vibrations coming from the source that we want to monitor. And in particular, this uh, graph here represent uh, on, a, on a specific uh, frequency the direction of the vibration. And so they are 
pointing to the Gulf of Lyon. So this is a demonstration that the, those sounds that we sounds, those vibrations that we were observing, were indeed coming from, were indeed due to, to, the, to a marine source. Uh, we have uh, many sources of disturbance that uh, would affect uh, an experiment like Einstein Telescope because uh, Einstein Telescope really wants to detect tiny, tiny uh, displacement of, uh, of the distance, okay? So you, have, you are really need to build it uh, in a very quiet place. And uh, in particular, I mean, if you, Virgo and LIGO, they can operate in, on the surface. But if you want to increase the sensitivity by a factor 10, well, you have to be careful that your noise is not, let's say, a, a, to a level where you will impact and you will then only hear noise and no more uh, black hole uh, merging, okay? So, uh, also magnetic disturbance will disturb uh, an instrument, a very sensitive instrument, because uh, magnetic field will start moving your lenses, your apparatus, etc., and will simulate a possible uh, uh, signal, okay. So we also check with uh, magnetometers. Here you can see some magnetometers which are sitting underground in, uh, in the Sosenatos mine. And, uh, okay, this is a spectrum where, this is a, uh, it's, it's a plot where you can see uh, in time and uh, the frequency of the signals. And uh, you can see, for example, this line here, this is just the 50 hertz of the, of, the, of the line, of the power lines, okay, which is permeating all European uh, continent. And you also barely see, I think, the 60 hertz, which is coming from, from the States, for example, because there are still, you know, it's a, it's a powerful disturbance. But then you can see more fundamental signals, for example, those one, those, uh, those lines here, those are the Schumann resonances. So those are, let's say, the Earth acting together with the ionosphere, acting as a cavity. And those vibration, uh, you can see the, the fundamental vibration and all the, the different harmonics. And then there are uh, other effects like geomagnetic pulsation that uh, uh, when, I mean, sometime the, 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 the earth and the ionosphere, they react and create other type of signals. So the fact that we see so well those signals means that the underground quality in Sosenatos, the environment, is very, very quiet. So it's, we are very happy about these conditions. Okay, if we want to build, I mean, Sosenatos is just in one place, but the, the interferometer will be larger. So we explore two other places by digging a few boreholes. So you can see the activity. The, those are 250 meter deep boreholes built, uh, digged in these two places here. And uh, inside the boreholes, we inserted seismometers. And then sta starting from the installation on September 2021, we continuously monitor the, the, the vibration inside these two boreholes in these two, two places. And what do we see? Well, we see uh, an exceptional uh, level of si seismic silence. This, this is the similar plot to the previous one, where you can see here the type of signal, the, the color one, and then in black, the level, the lowest level of possible level of seismic noise monitor on Earth in all the possible uh, seismic monitoring station. And we can say that between 4 and 7 Hertz, P2 in particular, but also P3 is at more or less at the same level, is the quietest seismic station worldwide. So we are very confident that this uh, land is seismically perfect for Einstein telescope. If we compare the measurement in the boreholes, same type of plot, amplitude of the disturbance as a function of, of frequency, for the two boreholes we have here, and the boreholes in the, um, in the Maastricht region, we can see that in particular from in, the, in the range from 1 to 10 Hertz, the, Sardinian, the Sardinia site is approximately a factor 10 more silent than the EMR place. So uh, one uh, disturbance that we know uh, can be uh, really a pain is the vibration coming from the, the wind farms. Because the, the windmills, when they start rotating, the tower vibrates, the tower is attached to the ground, and the, the ground will transmit the vibration all around, okay? 
So we did a, a measurement campaign. We have a, a big uh, windmill farm around here, and one of our uh, borehole is here. And then we installed a temporary uh, seismometer on the surface. And then you can see that the level of noise, now you are expert on this type of plot, and so you immediately recognize that this means more noisy than this one. So there is indeed some excess noise nearby the, wind, the windmills. And the, the, the amount of noise is also correlated to the, to the wind speed. We are still analyzing all the data in order to understand the effect of these windmills, but for the time being, the Italian government has uh, ex made an exclusion area around the AT candidate site to save the, the possibility of this site to become a real candidate. So there, there is now no possibility to build uh, noisy activity in this area. So this was already shown. Those are the, the project, the ethic project, 50 million that we got from the government. And in particular, the w part of the money will be used to perform a feasibility study of the AT infrastructure in Sardinia with geotechnical and engineering studies. This will be a key element for the Italian bid book and the, the work is expected to start in early 2024. And also, this is a very, very recent news. The Regione Sardegna has recently funded INFN with 10 million euros to further develop the Sosenato site. You have seen the pictures, but we want to do more and want to build a strong laboratory there. To, we want to upgrade and expand the surface site, but also to build a large underground laboratory that will be used together with our colleagues from ENAF and from the Italian Geovulcanology Institute to perform low seismicity measurement and it will also become a laboratory where we will be able to test the Einstein telescope technologies. So this we also will be another important element for the Italian ET bit book. And I come to the conclusion. So I hope I have convinced you that Sardinia is really a low seismicity region and indeed uh, it's really good for Einstein Telescope. Uh, we continuously see a strong and continuous support uh, by the Italian government uh, and Regione Sardinia. And the feasibility study for it in Sardinia in both the L and triangular shape discussed even before are about to start. So again, let me say once more that Sardinia is an optimal site where to build the Einstein Telescope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Let me add that Sardinia is a great place for many other reasons. So that's not to, not to, ne to be neglected. Since uh, uh, we are uh, running late, like half an hour, um, I think there's no time, unfortunately, to take questions, but the speakers will be with us, and so anyone interested can ask directly at the cocktail that we are about to start. Hopefully, I mean, we should go because they won't give us anything otherwise. So thank you for, um, thank you for coming, thank you for your patience, and to, until next time. Yes, there is, uh, I think, a, um, a slide about um, feedback to the, to, the, um, to the Science Week to this particular Science Week event and in general Science Week.